Okay, uh, so uh, I'd like to thank the Pacifist Accelerator uh, for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Um, I've learned a lot from these sessions over the last two years, so it's really great to have the chance to pass on some of our experiences. Um, and as Beverly mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about a student residence building, um, which we completed about 18 months ago back in 2020. Um, so first, a little bit about me. So I'm an architect and a certified pacifist designer at Public Architecture and Communication in Vancouver, BC, which, as some of you may know, uh, is the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. And so public is a, a multidisciplinary practice uh, which combines architecture and communication design. We're a medium-sized outfit with almost 30 people. And as the name implies, we're mainly focused on projects which benefit public life. So whether that be public institutions, public housing, public infrastructure, and so on. So the Skeena Residence, uh, it's a first pacifist project for the University of British Columbia. It's located at their Okanagan campus, which is a growing institution in Kelowna. It was also a first passive house project for us as the architects and the contractor as well. Um, it was completed in August 2020 through the early months of the pandemic. Um, and an important thing to note is that the nature of student housing is that completion before the middle of August is absolutely essential. So if you miss that deadline, um, you essentially miss an entire academic year. So failure to meet the schedule is not really an option. So here's a, a look at the program or the, the brief from the client. So it's for 220 student beds uh, with 110 bathrooms. So a bathroom shared for each two students. Um, and then we've got uh, study and social lounges on each level, common amenity rooms and storage rooms on the ground floor. Uh, that would be complete for the 2020 to 2021 academic year and built to a passive house standard. So as I mentioned, the project is located in Kelowna, which is about 400 kilometers from Vancouver and about a five hour drive. Um, it's in climate zone five. So it sees uh, bigger temperature swings from winter to summer than we see here on the coast. Um, Kelowna also experiences more regular wildfire smoke uh, and air quality advisories, which is an increasingly important factor when choosing to build to pacifier standards. The distance also became a challenge during the early months of COVID when air travel was suspended because many of the consultants were located in Vancouver. Uh, thankfully, we'd already engaged a local pacifist designer, Brett Cicello from Nido Design, who was able to provide additional field review support for us during the project. So in red here, you can see the location of the Skeena building, which is in the Northwest corner of the campus. It's backing into a forested hillside to the west, which provides some useful shading from the setting sun. Um, the north-south orientation of the building was set by the campus master plan, uh, and the building completes a sweep of student residences facing a large common field for activities. So the form of the building is really a sort of rational response to the program from the client and then the constraints of the BC building code. So in this part of the world, light wood framing is generally the most economical method for building a mid-rise residential building. And the code controls the maximum dimensions allowed with combustible construction. So we have a typical floor plan area, which is less than 1500 square meters, which allows for 44 student bedrooms and the associated social and study spaces on each level. We also have the maximum permitted six story height and just under 18 meters to the top floor. Uh, by being less than 18 meters, this height also means that the project avoids high rise building requirements, such as pressurization and venting of the exit stairs, which could complicate passive house air tightness. It also avoids the need for emergency diesel generators for the elevators. So the adherence to the constraints of the building code and the repetitive programming of the student rooms uh, set us up for a very simplified massing. The challenge after that was to find an architectural expression that could ground the building, uh, ground such a simple building form in its surroundings and express the function of the building in an honest way. Uh, so here we can see the north elevation of the building. 
And uh, for once you can see a hot air balloon in architectural photography that has not been photoshopped in, it's just a happy accident. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the importance of a compact building envelope when it comes to minimizing heat loss and meeting the passive air standard. Of course, many different building forms can be built to the passive air standard, but in order to do so affordably, you need to consider the form factor very early in design. We can express this compactness as a surface area ratio, which is the exterior surface area divided by the treated floor area. Roughly speaking, when your result is less than two, then you're on the right track to affordable passive house design. So for the Skeener project, our surface area ratio is 1.25, which uh, reflects the simplicity of the massing, although it's a fairly long and narrow form in plan. The only real creases in the form are to create entry canopies at the south and north, and otherwise it's sort of a pure uh, extruded rectangle. Uh, in addition to the simple form, there are a number of advantages for passive house that come with student housing typology in general and with our program specifically. So we've only got three exterior doors in the building. Um, we have no requirements for balconies. Um, it's not generally required in this type of project by this type of client. Uh, we have no underground parking. So vehicle parking is kind of taken care of elsewhere on the campus. Um, we've got a repetitive unit type, which helps with planning mechanical systems and so on. Um, and then also in our case, the client and the approving authority are one and the same. So the campus uh, was able to facilitate, you know, approvals for a building which is much more um, simple in its massing than, you know, precedent buildings around it. Um, and then a few challenges for the project. So we've had a very aggressive project schedule with an immovable deadline. Uh, the fact that Passive House was a new approach for the contractor. We required uh, relaxation to the primary energy targets for the building, which is, is pretty common for sort of densely occupied uh, multi-unit housing projects. Um, and then also the pandemic impact, which was a sort of unforeseen and unforeseeable uh, challenge. So our approach to the building structure and assemblies was to as much as possible use systems and assemblies that were familiar to trades who work on mid-rise residential buildings in Kelowna. This was in order to ensure competitive tendering of the work and also to guarantee that we could meet the project schedule. So the bones of the building are totally conventional, light wood framing for the walls and wood eye joists for the floors and roof on top of a concrete ground floor. Um, the on-campus location also provided a lot of set down space for materials, so the framers were able to set, set up an on-site prefab space and just crane sections of wall into place. Although the project brief from the client firmly committed to the passive house standard, in reality the final approval for the project budget from the board of the university and their authorization to construct would come only after tender, and so there was always a maybe small chance that um, the passive house element of the project could be removed just before issuing drawings for construction, which could be a major problem for the design team. Um, this was a known risk, so we took steps in design to protect the project schedule as best we could. So if we look at the wall assembly, um, everything to the left of grid line A is standard wood platform framing which is then wrapped in a sort of passive house jacket on the outside. We have eight inches of exterior rock wall insulation and the cladding supported on a thermally broken clip system. Air tightness is provided by a vapor open membrane on the outside of the structure with a vapor retarding primer on the interior drywall surface. This approach meant that if passive house was ultimately axed from the project, we could have reduced the exterior insulation thickness as needed without any significant knock on effects and the structural framing could have proceeded on schedule. Thankfully, that wasn't necessary. It was also important for the success of the project that there was a single point of responsibility for all the work from the wood sheathing outwards. So that meant a single responsibility for the air barrier, exterior insulation and finished cladding of the walls. And in this case, that role was performed by TRS Building Envelope in Kelowna and they were certainly a key part of the success of the project. Um, here you can see the air barrier in place and windows beginning to be installed. 
the simple building form meant that the membrane could be continuously rolled down all five stories of the wood framing and it's easy to inspect and repair if any damage occurs or if air leaks are identified. Now here we can see the next phase, which is the adding of uh, Cascadia fiberglass clips and steel girts to support the cladding. Eight inches of semi-rigid rock wool is then installed between the clips. And this is our final blower door test, which shows a result of 0 0.08 air changes per hour, which is a really phenomenal result for a crew working on their first pacifiers project. Um, this would make it one of the most airtight buildings in the country, in fact. And I think it's really a testament to the diligence of the trades and the construction manager, which was Sawchuck in Kelowna. Uh, the simple air barrier detailing and massing of the building were also a really important factor. So with regard to windows, we used a combination of West Tech vinyl windows for the typical residential windows combined with Shuko curtain wall frames for the larger openings at the ground floor and circulation spaces. Here's our typical window detail, which is fairly conventional. Window frame mounted directly on the wood framing and an, an interior rod and caulk seal for air tightness. We overlap the exterior insulation on all sides, including the sill, in order to improve the thermal bridge values around the opening. Uh, the sill flashing is sealed to the window frame and then there's an additional waterproof membrane to deal with any water penetration below this flashing. Here you can see an installed window um, before the adding of the exterior installation. The opening is surrounded by sections of pressure treated blocking for attaching the jam and head flashings. Uh, this blocking is intermittent with insulation in between to further reduce thermal bridging. And the finished windows look like this. Uh, they're fairly far recessed uh, in the opening, which creates some effective fixed shading. And with our cladding design, the intent was to play with this sense of depth and shadow in what's otherwise a very flat wall plane. Uh, so we have a primary material of Swiss pearl fiber cement, which pro projects forward by a couple of inches beyond the dark metal cladding behind. And even with a very simplified smooth massing, there are always exterior components which need to be fastened back to the structure through the exterior insulation. Uh, in this image, you can see one of the exterior rainwater leaders on the left, which descends from the roof and means that we could avoid using internal roof drains um, and the heat loss and complexity that goes with them. These rainwater leaders are oversized to prevent blockages from any ice buildup and to avoid the need for heat, for heat tracing them. Our solution for mounting them back to structure was simply to gang together three cladding clips at each floor level and mount a steel T-bracket to the outside of them, uh, so minimal thermal bridging involved. Here's the mechanical room located on the ground floor. Um, the program for the project allowed enough surplus uh, service space on the ground floor to locate the majority of the equipment inside the building. So the roof is free of equipment, except for a stub out for uh, a connection to a future potential solar PV system. And the mechanical design was by the AME group here in Vancouver, uh, contains all electric systems. So there's no gas connection to the building. Um, so you can see we've got a centralized ventilation system with three Swagon ERVs. Uh, one serving the ground floor amenity spaces and the other two working kind of in tandem to serve the residential levels. Uh, horizontal distribution through the, through the corridors on each typical level. Um, for space heating and cooling, we've got an air to water heat pump, uh, which is connected to Yaga fan coil units in each student suite uh, with an electric backup for, uh, for low temperature conditions. The delivery of, of the air source heat pump was the only really significant element to be disrupted by the pandemic. Um, and in the end, it wasn't installed until about a year after the building was occupied. A temporary system was used for the first year, but the delay did push back our final Pacify certification. And then for domestic hot water, we've got uh, two Colmac air to water heat pumps and a backup electric, electric resistance heat. There's a, a common laundry room on the ground floor for the students. Um, at the time, we were unable to source condensing commercial dryers. Uh, so these are conventional direct vent models. Um, the damper that you can see on the right 
uh, opens automatically when the dryers are in use to draw in makeup air from outside. So this heat loss is then captured in the energy model. Um, the damper then is then closed when the dryers are not in use. So here's a screen grab of the final energy performance in the PHPP. Uh, heating demand is at 7.4, so it's well under the threshold of 15 for certification. Um, the final blower door test result of 0 0.08 air changes per hour pulled down the heating demand by more than four kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So it has a really big impact on the final results. Um, as I mentioned, there were some delays with the arrival of the final mechanical plant that pushed back our passive air certification but this should be closed out in the coming weeks. Um, as part of the construction, the building was fitted with a series of monitors and sensors, which are connected to the building monitoring system. They measure temperature, humidity, CO2, VOCs, and fine particulates, et cetera. Um, this is part of the university's campus as a living lab program, where the engineering department uh, is studying the indoor environment and energy use of the Skeena building in relation to other student residences on campus. Uh, the building spent its first year at 50% occupancy due to the pandemic, but hopefully they can begin to report some initial uh, findings soon. So Skeena residence was completed on time in spite of the disruption of the pandemic. I think huge credit is due to the contractor, which was Sawchuck Developments uh, for steering the construction through a challenging time. Uh, and delivering a project that the campus is very proud of. It was also a great experience for us as the architects, um, and we're already putting into effect the lessons that we learned on other mid-rise pacifist projects that we're working on. And so with that, I'll hand it back over for questions. Thank you.